right. All right, if you have your Bibles today, open up to Genesis chapter 4. That's where we're going to be. And um, actually, we are just going to dive right into it today. So um, we're, we're walking through, and, and here's what we're seeing as we're reading through the book of Genesis. Um, there is a good way to do things if we just kind of use the wisdom God's given us, common sense. There is a better way when we listen to how God teaches us, but there's the best way that we discover through Jesus, and we're going to see the progression of learning wisdom from God through the book of Genesis. So here's what we've discovered so far. Episode 1, chapter 1, we read this, that there is one God, and this one God created the world and everything in it, and therefore he must be big and powerful to create everything. One God, Genesis chapter 1. Chapter 2, the story focuses and kind of changes focus a little bit, and we discover that God is not just big and powerful. Now, he is, but that's not all he is. God is not just big and powerful. God is also loving and good. And so this loving and good God who has created the world creates this beautiful garden just for the highest and greatest and his favorite of all of his creations, and that is us. That we humans, we're the greatest creation, his finest creation, and that he put us and he created us even in his own image so that he could love us, so that he could relate to us, so that he could walk with us, so that he could love on us because he just loves to hang out with his humans that he created. And he did not create us to live in isolation. He created us to live with him in relationship. He created us to live with each other in closeness of relationship. He created us to enjoy a really good life, but... Genesis chapter 3, we read last week, is where brokenness comes in. And if you've ever looked around wondering, why is there so much brokenness? Why is there so much pain? Why is there so much violence and evil in the world? The best explanation for the story comes in Genesis chapter 3, when our original ancestors, Adam and Eve, they chose not just to break some rule, even though it was a rule, but by breaking the rule, the heart of it was they said, God, we want to live life on our own terms. God, we don't want to have to depend on you. We want knowledge of good and evil on our own, not in dependence on you. So they eat the apple or the the fruit. We don't know if it was an apple. The fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. They break relationship with God. That is our story of where pain, violence, and even death comes from. Today, of course, you can guess where we're going. Genesis chapter 4. We're going to see just how far, uh, the, far reaching the consequences of their choice to disobey, their choice to do their own thing and disconnect with God. Here's how far it goes. So I'm just going to read the story to you, and then we're going to talk about it. Genesis chapter 4, starting at verse 1. Adam made love to his wife Eve. She became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel, the younger of the two brothers, Abel kept flocks. He was a shepherd. Cain worked the soil. He was a farmer. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, so you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? You've heard that phrase before. Now you know exactly where it came from. It came from Genesis chapter 4 right here. I don't know where my brother is. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord says, you do know where he is. Verse 10, the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and you are driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment, it's more than I can bear. 
Today, you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence, and he lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. That's a story. Inspiring, isn't it? I want you to think back for a moment. Reverse back the stories. Here's what, what happens sometimes when we read Bible stories is we just kind of read this little story, and we read one little segment, and we just kind of like, okay, nice little Bible story. And if, you know, you've been in church for a while, maybe you've heard this story before. Remember as a little kid and the, you know, the flannel graph boards, there's Cain and there's Abel and he goes out and he hits him and the, you know, Sunday school teachers didn't quite know what to do with that, right? Because we didn't have flannel graph with blood, you know, running all over the place, dripping into the ground. We're like, ah, oh, we need the sanitized version. So whether you got the sanitized version or the gory version, maybe you've heard the story before. The trouble is we don't always kind of stop to kind of connect some of the dots back and forward. I want you to think back a little bit. Here is Eve as she is standing there um, having the argument with you know, the devil, the tempter, who's telling her, it's going to be alright. When God said, if you eat of the fruit of the tree of the, the knowledge of good and evil, you won't die. You'll be like God. And she's like, God's keeping things from me. And she eats it. She doesn't die immediately. She hands it to Adam, who, who we don't really know whether he was there with her in the conversation the whole time or separated. But um, he knew he shouldn't be eating, and he made the choice to eat. And he's like, well, she gave it to me. She ate. She ate it. She didn't die. I guess it's going to be okay. They never imagined on that day that sometime later they would get a report that their youngest son, I get it right, that the oldest son has killed the youngest son. I've, I've heard, I've talked with parents whose, whose kids have passed away, and I regularly hear parents say something like this. I don't know if I can bear this. It's so out of order. Like kids are not supposed to pass away before parents. It's just the order of things And can you imagine Eve in the second generation of humanity dealing with the pain that her younger son Abel is gone and has been murdered in cold blood by her oldest son who now is also gone. And she has poured, I mean, the other part is we read these kind of stories and we think they just happen right away. Like, they, like one day Cain just didn't wake up and become a murderer, right? There was, there was a long time here. These are grown men by now. And Adam and Eve, they're like, we poured our lives into these kids. We loved them and we cared for them. We tried to teach them wrong from right. And look at what has happened. Our second son is gone and he's dead. And our oldest son is banished and we're never going to see him again. This is not the way life was supposed to be. And God says, no, it was not. This, unfortunately, is just the natural, it's just kind of the natural consequences of when we make one selfish decision, it leads to another selfish decision, which leads to another selfish decision. This is just the unfortunate consequences of life when we're not really seeking exactly and only what God wants for us. So let's just kind of slow it down a little bit, and let's look and see, like, what happened here? What are all the areas kind of where it went wrong? Because the, start, the story kind of starts off, the story starts off pretty innocently, right? It starts off with worship, where Cain and Abel, the farmer and the shepherd, they worship. And the way you worshiped, kind of in ancient times, was not you come to a church service and sing some songs and the preacher preaches a sermon and then you go home and say, yes, we worshiped. The way you worshiped was there's a God out there somewhere, And whatever I have, I want to give to or dedicate to the God that is out there somewhere. Now, as I remember as a kid, right, we're going to go to church and we're going to give an offering. And I used to wonder, like, how does it, like, how does God get the money? Do you just take your cash and, you know, like, here you go, God, and you throw it up in the air? And I thought, you could do that. Be like, okay, God, whatever you want, you take. And if you don't take it, I guess you don't want it. Throw it up and, like... I guess I didn't want any of it. Put it all back in my pocket. I don't know. At one point, I imagine that's maybe how it went. And then I figured figured it out. It's not how it goes. But how do you make an offering to God? You take something and you give it 
And then so, so, well, this is how it worked in the ancient times. They would take stones, they would pile them up, they would take what they had, they would take, leave it on that um, altar as an offering, and they would walk away. I used to think that um, offering an animal sacrifice to the Lord was kind of creepy until I realized one day as I'm standing over my grill, flipping the steaks, smelling the aroma of the fat on the edge of the steaks, and I'm like, oh, that smells so good, I can't wait to eat it. And then I read in the Bible, like an aroma pleasing to the Lord, and I'm like, oh, that is what is offering an animal sacrifice to the Lord. That's how it works. God's in heaven, and like the fat portions of the animal are on the the altar, and they're burning it, and there's this beautiful aroma rising up to heaven, and God's just like, oh, yeah, that smells good. It's an aroma pleasing to the Lord, just like when you stand over the grill, right? And the humans, they give it to God, and they say, God, we're going to give this to you instead of to ourselves. And I know you might say, well, it could be wasting, and it doesn't make sense, but, but it does make sense when you say, God, I believe in you, and so I'm going to give you something and walk away and not use it and not consume it for myself. I'm giving it to you. And so what we read is the story starts off pretty good as both these brothers, Cain and Abel, they want to give God something. Look at verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. He was a farmer, and so he cultivated fruits and crops and vegetables and grain. And so he brings some of the fruit and he offers what he has. And what he has worked really hard to produce, he offers it to the Lord. Okay, sounds good. Verse 4, Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. He's a shepherd, therefore what he has is sheep or others in the flock, and so whatever he has, he brings some of it, he offers to the Lord. They both have brought what they have worked really hard to produce to the Lord. But the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, the fat portions of the animals, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. And so what happened? What went wrong? Some people would say, based later on Scripture, that God, what God really wants for a sin offering and in response to our sin is to bring an animal. And so Cain did not bring an animal. He should have brought an animal. But, but that argument falls flat a little bit when God also gives instructions for how to give grain offerings. And so that's probably not the best explanation. Probably the best explanation for, that, that helps us understand why God accepted Abel's offering but not Cain's offering is as it describes Abel's offering. Look, look what it says here at the, um, at the uh, right in the middle of verse 4. Here's what Abel brought. He brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. What Abel brought was the best part of the first. Abel gave to God the best of the first. He didn't God, give God the leftovers. He didn't give God the animal that, like, well, that animal might not make it anyway, so if I have to give an offering to God, I'll give it the animal who's really not going to make it. No, he takes his first, and he gives the best part of the first to God. My guess is that Cain was out harvesting the grapes, the fruit, the berries, the grain, whatever else, and he was hungry, and so he took for himself the first crop. Abel gave to God the first. Cain kept for himself the best part. Abel gave to God the best part. His heart was in the right place. His motives were in the right place. And so God looked on, looked on Abel's offering of the first and the best with favor, but he looked on Cain's offering of just the leftovers in which his heart were not in the, was not in the right place. Maybe he was just bringing something to God just to kind of appease God out of duty and out of obligation. He did not look favorably on Cain's offering. And look what it says here at the end. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. As I was reading and studying this week, uh, one, of the, one of the commentaries I, I read that was written by my, my old seminary professor, he said this. That word there for angry um, is, um, yeah, can we throw that, throw that back up on the, do we have the end of that one that we can put back up there? Yeah, so Cain was very angry. He said that word angry is kind of an interesting word there. Um, and when translators translate it into English, they kind of struggle with it because it literally means hot. He was hot 
and his face was downcast. And so translators and scholars have read that and thought, well, then that just it means, means angry. Like God, God confronted him. God said, I don't really like your offering as much as I like your brother's offering. I don't accept your offering. Cain was kind of embarrassed about that. Cain has been confronted about that. We don't like to be embarrassed. We don't like to be confronted. And so Cain gets hot as a result of it. So Cain gets hot and his face is downcast. And he's feeling something he doesn't like to feel. So as I was reading and studying, I thought, you know, I remember times when, well, I remember one time I was in a a, a choir with, when I was in, in, uh, in college, and we'd travel around and sing choir concerts at churches. And I remember the exact church where we were on a Sunday morning, and we were singing, and we're singing this big, loud song, and there was a place where there was a rest. And in a place where a rest, you're not supposed to sing anything. It's supposed to be silence. And I missed the rest And I was the only one who sang a note in the rest. And everybody's quiet, and I'm like, la! Really awkward moment, right? And the choir director looks at me, kind of winks at me, kind of smiles a little bit. And you you know what happened? Hot. (laughs) Red. Embarrassed. And of course, because we humans are so naturally self-centered, we're like, I'm pretty sure everyone in the whole crowd remembered that all day long, and they all went home talking about the one guy who sang, and no, they probably didn't. They were probably like, well, that was awkward, funny. I'll finish out the song. Totally forgot about it. Not me, though, right? Because I'm like a human, pretty self-centered, think I'm the center of the world. Embarrassed, hot, red. I continued to sing the song, but what I felt like doing was downcast. Could it be that in this moment, Cain was probably angry, but also embarrassed, hot, faces downcast. And so God confronts him. And if you think about it, this confrontation is actually the mercy of God. Like he has disappointed God. And so God says, here's here's an opportunity for a teaching moment, Cain. I want to teach you something. I know you're feeling embarrassed. I know you can barely face me. You're feeling like, I don't care about you, and I didn't like the gift that you gave, and we all know that your heart is not quite right. So, so Cain, let me teach you, because I really want you to get it right. Verse 6, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why hot? Why downcast? Let me teach you something. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Cain, you knew. If you would have brought me the first and the best, No embarrassment. I would have accepted your offering. No heat, no downcast. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, look at this, this is amazing, this is a great little image here. If you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. And here we get a little image of sin that's really helpful. Too often, like we said last week, we just treat sin as if it's like a rule that is like sometimes broken because rules are made to be broken, right? You know, it's, uh, everybody messes up every now and then. And he says, no, 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 pay attention. Sin is like a powerful force. He says, sin is like a dragon crouching at the door, waiting for you to come out. Sin is like a force that hunts you down, and it knows you, and it's been watching your steps, and it knows your tendencies, and it is crouching, and it is ready to pounce, and it's coiled back, and you better watch out because it wants to devour you. Don't mess with it. And you're feeling it right now, Cain. And you better master it, or it will devour you. Sin is a power, not just some rule to be broken. You see, we talk about our kids. We talk to our kids about things like this, right? We say, look, just because it feels good doesn't mean you can do it. Just because you're angry at your brother or your sister and you feel like hitting them doesn't mean that you can just do whatever you feel like doing. We just got done singing a song about that because we adults hopefully are wise enough to realize that whatever I feel like doing, just because I feel like it doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. In fact, for some reason, sometimes I get these urges to do or say the exact wrong thing that will I know will hurt other people. And there's a part of me that's kind of like, I hope they get hurt because they deserve it. And God says, sin is crouching at your door. And just because it feels good or you think it will feel good doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Exercise some self-control and God says, I will fill you with my spirit so that it's not just self-control, but it's spirit-guided control because not everything you feel is the right thing to do. 
Sin is a power like a dragon crouching at your door. Kind of like the old story you've heard of the grandson. You're trying to keep, teach his grandson, the grandfather who's trying to teach his grandson a lesson. And he says, grandson, when you feel this way, it is like there are two wolves living inside of you. One for good and one for evil. The one for good wants patience and joy and love and wants to do the right thing. But the one for evil is greed and self-centeredness and pride and all, all, all envy and jealousy and all that bad stuff. And it's like the wolves are fighting each other for control. And the grandson says, well, which one wins? You've probably heard it before. The grandfather says, whichever one you feed. And God says, Cain... Right now, you've got a choice. You messed up on the sacrifice thing, but now you've got a choice. You're downcast, embarrassed, heat, and you can feed that with all those thoughts and all the messages that are running through your mind right now, what you would like to do, what you could do, and and you can feed that. Or you can feed the force for good that I'm here and my Holy Spirit is actually working, is trying to get, like you can feed that message and you can listen to that message. Which one are you going to feed? Unfortunately, what we see in the story is we know which one Cain fed. And what Cain did, even though his offering was rejected by God, is he didn't just stay mad at God, but he looked at his brother Abel, whose offering was received by God, and he grew envious of his brother Abel. He grew jealous of his brother Abel. He became hateful of his brother Abel. He hated his brother's success. And he's like, God likes you more than he likes me. And he says, hey, brother Abel, let's go for a walk. And he takes him out in the field, far away from everyone else. And in a moment of premeditated murder, he takes his life. It's terrible. I mean, we are like second generation in and already the humans are killing each other. So God, who's already warned him, now he's got to bring justice because God is a God of justice. God loves us so much. God loved Abel so much that he just does not overlook his murder. And he says, Cain, there has to be consequences. So here are the consequences that come, verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? I don't know. He said, am I my brother's keeper? In other words, aren't I responsible only for myself? Why are you asking where my brother is? And he said, God's like, no, you're actually like how you treat other people. It really, really matters. Yes, you are your brother's keeper. Yes, you are supposed to take charge of yourself and be responsible, and that includes how you treat other people. We say it all the time. I can do whatever I want to do as long as it doesn't hurt anyone. The reality is it always hurts someone else. And he says, are you, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are your brother's keeper. And the Lord said, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Strong words there. And God says, I'm going to come because I'm a God of justice and I'm going to avenge or bring justice to your brother's blood. In other words, the loss of your brother's life. And so you are under a curse. You're driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood. The ground has already been under a curse from Adam's sin, and now he says, for you, it's going to be an extra curse. In fact, you're a farmer, and you're going to work like crazy to grow things, and nothing is going to grow. You're going to actually regress in social development to just a hunter-gatherer, and you're just going to wander the earth for the rest of your life, hunting and gathering just to eke out a survival. And there's going to be a pattern here of anger, of murder, of fighting. And people are going to figure out by their conscience that, well, the only thing to do is when somebody murders somebody else, it's only right that we then take their life that we can't trust them in society anymore. And so the problem with, like, avenging someone else's blood is when you avenge your brother's blood, then somebody avenges your blood, and the cycle of violence just continues. Here's what I see. Here's what I see. There's a cycle here, okay? Okay. That, that I believe, and this is where it directly relates, relates to all of our lives. There's a cycle. We do something wrong. It's the offense, okay? And Cain offered a sacrifice that God did not accept. He did not bring his best in his first. He, is, he offends God or offends somebody else. So there's the offense. And then when they're confronted about it, when we are confronted about it, then comes the heat, the embarrassment, downcast. So the offense, the heat, the embarrassment. And then at that point... 
it can go one of two directions. Fight or flight syndrome kind of kicks in, right? And you can fight and have an angry outburst and deal with the heat and the embarrassment by taking it out on someone. Or flight, you can run and hide and self-isolate and shame and self-loathing. I'm such a terrible person. Why don't I ever get it right? Oh, I just hate myself. When am I ever going to get it right? And so there's a cycle, right? The offense, the heat, fight or flight. What does Cain do? Offers a sacrifice, offense, the heat, embarrassment. He chooses fight, and he goes after Abel, who had done nothing wrong at all. That actually continues on through the generations, okay? And what we read is the story goes on, Cain goes on, and he has kids, and they have kids, and they have kids, and they have kids. By the time they get to the seventh generation, this cycle of violence and vengeance has gone on for so long, we get to the seventh generation human, and um, his name is Lamech. And he comes in one day, and he tells his wives, I just got in a fight with a man who attacked me, and I killed him. And I tell you what, if anybody ever comes around to avenge my death, you avenge their death 77 times over. As if it's something to be bragged about. Like, if anybody comes to kill me because I killed him, <clears throat> then you find whoever kills me and you kill them and 76 others of their closest relatives and friends. That's how great I am. Talk about arrogance. Talk about this myth of like redemptive violence. And what we see here is it just has, I mean, like humanity has spun out of control. The cycle has continued and there's fighting, there's war, there's violence. It's bad. Everybody's chasing down everybody and it has spun out of control. So here's the question. How do we stop the cycle? Offense, embarrassment, fight or flight. How do we stop it? We've got to stop the cycle so that all of society doesn't kill each other. Some people would say in our kind of postmodern mindset, well, if we just stop believing in God and all of his rules, then there is nothing to be offended about. The problem is the very same people who advocate not believing in God anymore and kicking out God and his rules and his morals, they just replace them with a whole bunch more rules and morals, and if you don't follow them and obey them, then they shame you or cancel you, whatever it may be. And so the idea of just casting out all morals and rules and laws, that doesn't work because it, we're hypocrites anyways when we try it. So that's not going to work. That's not how we stop the cycle. Maybe we stop the cycle a different way. Maybe, maybe we just need... You know, maybe we just need to really clearly know what's right and wrong. And part of what we see in, in, in these early chapters is they were just kind of going by conscience. They were kind of just going by, you know, um, um, uh, wisdom and, and uh, common sense. And later on, we're going to see that God in the Old Testament actually gives them some laws. He says, okay, let me just clearly explain to you how I want you to worship to me. At this time of the year, I want you to bring this animal and, bring, and sacrifice this portion of this animal. And he gets really, really specific in the Old Testament. Because he wants to make sure that they at least have the correct information so that they can do it right. And he says, at this time of year, you bring grain offerings. At this time of year, you bring a bull. At this time of year, you bring a lamb. And God spells it out very clearly. And he says, this is how I want your society to operate. And we have hundreds of laws and morals given by God so that people can do it exactly as God wanted. And God completely educates them with a really good system for how to live their lives, worship, and society. And that solves the problem, right? A little bit. It's better than the good of just following your conscience and common sense. What we see here is good when God gives the laws in the Old Testament that's better. But we still need a lot of law enforcement to keep it all in check. We still need a lot of militaries to keep nations from invading and completely destroying each other. It's better there's a part of us that still thinks there's an even better solution. We've not yet landed on the best solution. How do we stop the cycle? What if in the cycle of offense, heat, embarrassment, shame, fight and flight, what if right in there we could get to our inner heart when we're feeling embarrassed and the heat is ruling the day and we're trying to decide, am I going to fight or run and isolate? What if in those moments we could stop the cycle there? 
But we'd have to get deep, like to our heart, the inner life. The heart is like the center of our motivations and dig to our motives. One of the most helpful things for me was to learn in the study of psychology and counseling that, that anger is actually what we call a secondary emotion. And what that means is, when you're feeling angry, anger's not all there is. There's something underneath it, a primary emotion, that's driving the anger. And whenever you're feeling angry, one of the wisest things you can do is stop and say, okay, God, why am I feeling angry? Is it being fueled by jealousy, and so I'm angry? Is it being fueled by some shame, therefore I'm angry? Is, is it pride that is fueling the anger? Like, what is at the root of the anger? But that's, a, that's an inner question you have to ask. There's no law that can guide that. That's not even like common sense that can guide that. But when you're in that, in that cycle, the way we break the cycle, God says is, what is going on inside of you? What are the messages that I'm listening to? And the message Cain was listening to was, God doesn't like me. God doesn't like my sacrifice. Why? It's Abel. It's his fault. He and his sheep that he gave to the Lord. And that's where he let his mind go. And that's where he kind of let it spin. And that was, the, that was kind of the, the voices that he was listening. And then those voices of jealousy, those voices of envy, those voices of pride were ruling the day. And he was feeding that wolf inside of him. And he was feeling it. And that fueled him to take that fateful walk with his brother out into the field and he kills him. Jesus comes along and Jesus comes along with the best solution. And Jesus says, look at your heart. Look at the motives of your heart and what is going on inside of you. In one of, our, one of, the, one of the passages in the New Testament, Jesus says, let me, let me think of, tell you even the best way to think about things. Let me, let me ask you to think about the connection of worship in your relationships with other people. Look what we read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. If you're offering your gift at the altar, in other words, if you're at the temple and you've brought the animal, you've brought the crops, you, you bring the sacrifice that God has told you to bring and you're excited because it cost you something. It's your first and your best and you're there and you're going to set it and you're like standing in line and the priest is gonna, like, you're going to be next when the priest is done helping the guy in front of you. If you're standing in line with your offering and it's this great moment of worship, and you remember, look what he says here. If you're, at, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. In other words, if you know that you've got relationship troubles, anger, it's been fueled, jealousy, pride, all that messing with relationships. Offering a gift on the altar isn't going to solve that. Praying a whole bunch isn't going to solve that. Giving something to God isn't going to compensate for how you sinned against someone else. He says, stop the worship, go make things right with your brother or sister, and then come back and continue the worship. Because yes, you are your brother or sister's keeper. How you treat them, how you talk to them, how you interact with them, it really, really matters. And if you're too proud to be reconciled to another human, you're probably too proud to be reconciled to God because there's always a connection between how you treat others and how you treat God. Here's where I'm going with this. As I've read and studied this story this week, my mind continues to go back to this. What would it have taken for things to be different in Cain's story? The easy answer is, well, he shouldn't have murdered his brother. <laughs> well, duh. The easy answer is, he should have just given God first and best. Well, duh. If answers are that easy, he would have done it. There's more going on there, okay? If it was that easy, you would do the right thing all the time instead of messing up sometimes. So here's what I thought. What if Cain, in the moment of the heat and the embarrassment, instead of fueling anger and rage in him, what if he would have looked over to his brother Abel and rather than feel jealousy and envy and in pride walks away and continues those thoughts, what if in humility he would have said, my brother knows something I don't know. 
my brother knows how to honor God. I need to learn something from him. What if he would have walked over to Abel and said, Abel, I don't even know why. I really messed up. But you've got a good thing going with God. Would you teach me? That would have required a lot of humility. That would have required fighting against the voices of both anger to fight and flight and run away and isolate and self-loathing. It would have been hard to walk to him in humility and say, you're my younger brother, but you know what God wants. Teach me. What would it have been like for Cain to go over to Abel and embrace him and say, I, I just, I, I just so appreciate your heart for the Lord. And I mess it up, but I can celebrate your heart for the Lord. What would it have been like if Cain could have celebrated his brother's successes and could have humbled himself to learn from his brother? What would have happened is it would have stopped the cycle right there. It would have kicked the dragon crouching at his door. It would have kicked the dragon in the teeth. In a similar situation with Jesus. His disciples go out one day. They go on a little mission that he sends them to. They come back. And they're like, Jesus, guess what? We found some guys. And they were healing people and casting out demons in your name. They're not one of us. And so we told them to stop. Good job, right, Jesus? He's like, oh, you guys. <laughs> They were healing people in my name. They must know something about me. If they're not against us, they're for us, guys. And in that moment, even Jesus' followers' pride had ruled the day. He's like, no, let's celebrate their successes and maybe you can learn something from them, but it's going to require you to stop the cycle and humble yourself. Celebrating other successes, learning from the strengths of others, but that means you've got to admit your own weaknesses. And all of a sudden we see in this ancient story of the first murder, there's something in there for all of us. That every one of us engages this cycle of offense, embarrassment, fight, flight, what do I do? And in those moments, what would it look like to humble ourselves? To go find someone else and say, Teach me, pray for me, disciple me, I admire you. What could change in your life, in your marriage relationship, when the cycle gets going, you stop, you humble yourself, you go back to your spouse, say, I'm sorry, I messed up, will you help me? What could happen in your job if th that coworker who just seems to be better at the job than you are, if you were to go to him and say, can you teach me? Can you teach me how to use this machine? You just do it better than I do and you're faster at it. Can you show me how to do it? It stops the cycle. So how about you? Who in your life of whom you are slightly jealous could you begin to celebrate their successes? Maybe even going so far to give them a compliment, even while you're still battling the little bit of jealousy and envy inside. Give them a compliment, congratulate their successes, and maybe even humble yourself enough to say, can you teach me what I don't know? If you do it, and we do it, maybe it could catch on. That's the way of Jesus, which is the best way. Let's pray. God, God, why does the force of pride and self-centeredness have to be so strong in our lives? God, how is it that here we are thousands of years later, and sin is still crouching at our door. So Jesus, today, 
in humility before you, we just proclaim again, we need you. We don't want to take the way of Cain. We don't want to perpetuate this endless cycle of selfishness, envy, and violence. So God, I pray, would you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, bring us to a place of humility. To celebrate the successes of the people around us rather than letting jealousy rule the day. To learn from those who are stronger and smarter and better and wiser and advanced rather than competing. God, it's a hard and a dangerous prayer to pray to say, God, humble us, but God, even this week, would you show us in our relationships with other people opportunities that you have given us to stop the cycle and to let humility win the day. Lead us, Jesus. Lead us, oh Holy Spirit, to do that which is unnatural, but it is best. Lord, I pray that even now, every one of us would have in our mind's eye the picture of someone in our lives for whom giving a compliment might be really tough. But God, I pray, would you give us the opportunity this week? Give us the words to say, and in humility, we'd stop that cycle of envy and jealousy in our own lives. For you, Jesus, for your glory, for your honor, because we really do want our lives to look a whole lot more like you every day. We pray these things in your name. Amen.